Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Can I ask you to please take your seats? I'd like to welcome you all here this evening to what is for us the fourth annual observance by the Kupferberg Holocaust Center of Kristallnacht, but in actuality, it is the 70th anniversary to the day of the event that we refer to as Kristallnacht. I wanted to really have this event at 5 o'clock, but I, the reason was I wanted you all to see when you pulled on campus the building that's under construction over on the right-hand side. Uh, that building in May of 09, which is not too far away, that building will be the Kupferberg Holocaust Center at Queensboro Community College. So to a certain extent, this event that we're having here today is most historic because it will represent the last Kristallnacht commemoration program in this room. And next time we have a major Holocaust Center program such as Kristallnacht or the opening of an exhibit, it will be in our new Holocaust Center. And I might add one thing, for those of you who are here and are interested in our programs, we will be delighted for you to sign up and become members. And one of the reasons we are most effective in putting together this powerful program on Holocaust education, and as it looks now, we have about 200 people in the room, which is quite flattering, and we have an excellent program in store for you today. But the person who really came up with the dream of the Holocaust Center is our president. And I want to share just a brief story with you uh, about Dr. Marti. Okay. Okay. Uh, about six months ago, I met with a group of rabbis in Queens to get them more involved in the Holocaust Center, and it worked out quite well, and they have responded very effectively. And while we're speaking, one of the rabbis said to me, uh, Arthur, we want to ask you a question. Uh, this fellow Marty, who's the head of the college, his mother Jewish? I, I said, no, no, no. Well, what about his father? I said, no. Um, someone in the family? No. So why is he doing all of this? I said, because he believes in it. Because he absolutely believes in people learning about the Holocaust, not simply because you're Jewish, because it is the right thing to do. And I'd like to call him up for words of welcome, Dr. Marti. I thought I had no remarks. <laughs> thank you very much, Arthur, and thank you for those very, very kind words. Um, you know, some of you know me, and some of you know that I seldom have prepared remarks. But uh, I wanted to say what is in my heart, and I wanted to say it precisely. So forgive me for reading these remarks, because they do come from the heart. I'm proud to be here tonight. I am proud because I preside over a community of scholars who embrace the concept that through education, we can ensure that prejudice is not left to flourish. I'm proud to be here tonight because soon, finally, we will have a facility that will forever stand as a beacon of civility among the hundreds of thousands of young men and women who will come to study throughout the years at this college. We will teach the students about the need to speak out at our center. 
Imagine if the German government unleashed the po that, that unleashed the pogrom, killing over 91 Jews, injuring hundreds more, and destroying 267 synagogues. Imagine if those citizens would have said, no, this is, our, this is not our government. We will not permit, permit these atrocities. It is my hope that as students from all corners of the world who attend our college would learn the power of their conviction, the power of their ability to stop prejudice whenever and wherever it happens, I know that they will not be able to ignore the Holocaust. The building will greet them every morning as they walk to campus from parking their car or from coming from the bus and the name Kupferberg Holocaust Resource Center will say hello. Some of them will not know what the Holocaust is. And they will ask. They will ask their teachers. They will ask each other. And there is our teaching moment. There is the time that we can grab them and tell them what important it is to understand what happened what started happening, if you will, 70 years ago in Germany. This, ladies and gentlemen, is going to be a beautiful building with a glass case covered by a concrete encasement. This will always remind, it, remind us of what happened 70 years ago. Half of that glass case, by the way, is a space that holds about 100 people. Half of that glass space will be clear glass, symbolizing the future and the clarity of thought. Half of that glass case is going to be cracked glass, obviously symbolizing crystal nacht. We are not going to be, and we're not, a museum. And we're not solely a research center. We are a laboratory, a place for our students to experience firsthand the lessons of all those brave men and women who only by their ethnic origin and religion were persecuted and killed. But these very people have taught us, those of us who have been oppressed, that perseverance, hard work, intelligent education will enable us to prevail and to thrive. I am proud to be here tonight. I am proud of what we do together for the future of Queens and for the future of New York City. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Marti. I would now like to call upon Karen Koslowitz, the Deputy Borough President of Queens, to come up. One of the absolutely wonderful things that we benefit from by having people such as Karen Koslowitz and Borough President Helen Marshall is the fact that they do two things as far as the Holocaust Center goes. Number one, they are very, very strong believers in what they do, and they're also very realistic believers in that they supply us with a, a significant amount of funding, and that funding helps us operate. So, Karen? Thank you, Arthur. On behalf of our borough president, Helen Marshall, it is my pleasure to be here tonight and be here to recognize the people who suffered for many, many years in the Holocaust. Holocaust, I was a little girl. It's not too often I could say that for things. I was a little girl when the Holocaust was going on, probably about three years old. And I remember my uncle coming home from Germany and the horror stories that he told us. I also remember my mother, who was born in Poland, and before the Holocaust, when the Russians, the Nazis, came in and took my grandfather away to ne never to be seen again because he was Jewish. 
This is something we can never, never forget. And by having this night, Crystal Knock, and being here reminds us, and we must remind everybody, that this shall never happen again, and we have to make sure of that. I want to thank Arthur Flug for <clears throat> doing this year after year. We usually have it in Borough Hall, but thank goodness we've outgrown Borough Hall and we are here. And I look forward next year to being in the new building. I also want to thank Roseanne Dosh from our office who works with Arthur to make this possible. And of course, to you, Dr. Marty, for having us here tonight. Thank you very much. And I just want to add that the borough president has given a million plus dollars for this center to be built. Thank you. Karen, thank you so much for those good words and thank you so much for the money. <laughs> as far as Crystal knocked, uh, I was thinking of what to say to begin our program so you'll have some understanding of Kristalna. And over the weekend, um, I don't know why, but sometimes your memory <coughs> seems to project things into your mind and sometimes into your speech that you haven't even thought of. And uh, this morning, as I woke up, I suddenly remembered my ninth grade English teacher at Jamaica High School. Now this is going back about 55 years. Mrs. Ryan, who was not an exceptional teacher, but one day, and this is the only thing I really remember, she walked up to the blackboard and took a piece of chalk and made a big X. The X was about three feet in length. And she says, when the lives of two people cross, you have a story and sometimes you have a cataclysmic story. That's the only thing I remember her ever doing, aside from learning the book Silas Marner. And, and what, and when I thought of that, it just came into my mind and I realized that precisely is the event that we're talking about tonight. What happened in 1938 a group of about 10 to 15,000 Polish citizens living in Germany for almost 40 years were expelled. And when they were expelled, they were sent to Poland. Poland said, we don't want you. Germany said, we don't want you. So they were forced to stay in a small town on the Russian, on the German-Polish border. The Conditions were terrible. There was not enough food. There were no sanitary conditions. And word of this horrendous situation came back to France. And in France was a young man, Herschel Greenspan. He heard about this. He was 17 years old. And he realized from the information he got, his mother and his father were part of that contingent of Polish Jews being sent back. And he was distraught listening to the horror stories, feeling rather helpless that he couldn't do anything because he was in Paris, France. At age 17, he decided to do something. He went to the nearest store that he could find and he bought a gun. And there was no such thing as gun control laws today. He bought a gun and went to the German embassy in Paris. And what he had in mind was he was going to find the German ambassador, shoot him, kill him, and the world would be take notice and be so angered at what was done to the Jewish community that they would rise up and save those people who were trapped with his mother and father. At the German embassy, when he entered, uh, there were no magnometers that you walk through today, uh, he couldn't find a German ambassador, so what he found was Ernst von Rath, the third consul 
and the embassy, and he shot him, hoping that deliverance would now come to his mother and father. He was immediately arrested. Von Roth went into the hospital and died three days later. But the day he was shot, word immediately got back to Germany. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and in Nuremberg, where there was a meeting of Nazi party leaders, they heard what happened. And they said, this is outrageous. Look what has happened. A Jew has killed an Aryan. Had the situation been reversed, it will probably turn into a celebration. But here they were outraged, <clears throat> and the cry went out for Jewish blood. Two days later, Ernst von Rath was dead. He was given a funeral unlike any other we have ever seen before as being one of the truest heroes of the Nazi socialist country. And on the night of November 9, 1938, a telegram was sent to each police station in Germany, signed by Heinrich Heydrich, saying that as a result of what took place, there were going to be spontaneous uprisings in every city in Germany where there was a Jew with the following instructions. All synagogues were to be burned, all houses what to be put in a state of disorder. All Jewish-owned businesses were to be attacked. However, if you had a German-owned business, and, and this is in his orders, if you had a German-owned business and it was next to a synagogue, don't set the synagogue on fire because it may destroy the German business or the German residence that was there. I tell this to my students, and one of the problems you have teaching history is, if it hasn't happened in the past 10 years, it happened what's called long ago, where Julius Caesar, Abraham Lincoln, and Moses lived in that period long ago. And try to give the students some relevance, I have two basic assets. One asset is that one of the things the Germans did, the Nazis did, was to document every single crime they committed as a testimonial to what they were looking forward to, to create a museum. And it was called for a race that once existed. The first time, about three years ago, I showed this documentary film to my students. It shows the synagogue in Baden, Baden, in flames. And we have a picture of it here on the side if you want to look at it. Uh, after we, the ceremony is over tonight, and it shows the synagogue burning, uh, the windows breaking, the flames jumping out of the windows, and then the cameraman panned around. And in panning around, he showed the people there, and the first two people he comes to are very plainly a police officer and a fireman. And they're standing there with their arms folded, pointing, look at that, and they're laughing. And one young lady gets up and he said, damn it, why aren't they going in there? And I said, you know, she's naive, she doesn't understand. But then I realized I was the one who was naive because these students came from being old enough during 9-11 to realize that in a free and democratic society, if the building is burning, the firemen and the policemen are not the perpetrators, but they're the ones who run into the building to rescue whoever is there without asking, what is your religion? What do you believe in? What is your affiliation? They go in there to rescue people and material because that's their job. I felt very comforted in that. I said, there is a great deal of hope that students can look at something that happened almost 70 years ago and see how wrong it is how much it defies what they believe to be true. The other asset that we have to deal with is an extremely dynamic and potent and very effective asset is we have a large group of Holocaust survivors in the Queens community and many of them, many of them come together 
at the Holocaust Center for various programs that we have. One of the couples that comes together, uh, at first they started coming to what we call our Bagels and Talk program for Holocaust survivors, and then they began attending our lecture program, is Claire and Emic, Eric Hyman, who were teenagers in Germany at the time of Kristallnacht. Uh, if you read the Queen's Tribune, you may have read a full page story about them and their uh, experiences. But if you haven't, I would like to call them up now, Eric and Claire Heyman. I was born in Germany in a little town, Großheubach. Großheubach is a small town about an hour away from Frankfurt by train. We lived in a town by 6,000 people, and we were, we, we, had, we were five children, my grandfather and my parents. My older sister left already, German, uh, left already for Frankfurt, and we were four kids home. I was 14, I had a brother five, and a sister eight. And we, my father was always interested, always listening to radios. And one day he comes home and he says, Jenny, if we're not gonna leave now, we go with a knapsack. My mother would always say, this will all pass. So one morning, my father went to Kleinheubach there was more Jews. We were only two families in the town, a Catholic town. I went to Catholic school and had my Hebrew training three times a week at home. My parents were Orthodox. And my father, the first thing when he heard that burning the synagogue in Frankfurt, my father went across the ferry to Klein Heubach where our synagogue was. He wanted to save the Torah. And our synagogue was between houses in a little street. And the people in Klein Heubach was very Nazi, big Nazis, and they wouldn't let my father go to the synagogue. He wanted to save the Torahs. So two Nazis came, he says, you better leave now before we kill you. So he, we had to go by ferry across to Klein Heubach, you know, across the river, across the mine. And my father came back and he says, we better be, we all stay here together, and we hope it doesn't happen to us that in, in Kleinheubach, the people were already taken away and they demolished the houses in Kleinheubach, but they wouldn't come to us. So my mother, it was Thursday, she says, they're not going to come to us, it's already four o'clock, so I'm going to make my challah because I had to take the challah to the bakery for Shabbat, but the bakery next door, and I came back and I said to my mother, you know, Muti, there was a salesman there who said, Goebbels called off no more demolishing houses. So we, so we had an early dinner, and he had a dairy dinner, and my brother was five, and my sister eight. My, they put him on nightgowns already, so we should go to bed early and sleep behind my grandfather's bedroom. There was no windows. And it was six o'clock, we all had dinner together, and around seven o'clock, we heard some marches come, some, some cars coming. We had, the next town was Miltenberg, a mine. It came, it stormtroopers came, about 15 stormtroopers to our house. And we were all sitting there. My brother was hysterical and screaming. He ran out of the house. He went in the backyard where my neighbors in the barn and they're hiding there. And my sister Inge, she was standing on the door and he says, what are you doing to us? And they pushed her away. And about 7.30, the neighbor comes out. It was a butcher and he screamed at them. And he says, if you're not gonna leave, I take my ax and hit your head off. So the son came out and he says, Papa, come, don't do that. Get in the house, they're taking you away too. 
around 8.30 at night, we were, they ripped our beds, the feather beds open, demolished all the windows, to, to my mother uh, pushed her away when she says, don't do that, don't do that. And about nine o'clock, they took us all together in a, in a, in a truck and shipped us to Miltenburg in, overnight in a, fe, in a gefängnis, in a prison. In a prison. So when we got there, we saw already all surrounding Jews were there in Miltenburg. And my father was there and my grandfather. My grandfather and my father had to walk. It's about five kilometers. They had to walk to Miltenburg. So when we were there a day and a half, and they let us go back home. So we had nothing. You know, we had a, a ceramic stove. We had in every room, we, we didn't have central uh, heating system. In every room we had our stoves, they were all demolished. And they sent my father to Dachau for eight months. And all our, that was right after, he was there one night, the next day they shipped him to Dachau. And we came home, so we, it was already cold, so all the neighbors helped us. And one neighbor who was already in a Nazi party, but he knew he was in a business installation for bathrooms. And he had a, a, a tremendous business, but he was a neighbor. So he came with a few fellas and he installed some stoves for us the next day. And we had very good neighbors who helped us and brought us food and helped us clean the house. And here was my mother with us four kids. My sister was in Frankfurt already because she was a year and a half older than me. And she was going to the consul, the Dominican consul, and she tried to get an affidavit from my father to get him out of Dachau. And the, the consul from the Dominican Republic did a lot of false affidavits to get people out of the prison. So it took us eight months, and we had a very rough time, you know, till my father came home. And when he came home, he said to us, Mutti, if we don't go now, we go with a knapsack. My mother would never say, this will all pass. She was so German. She, she didn't want to believe it. She did not want to believe it, and that's the story. And then, in 1941, they took us, my sister and I, we went to Berlin to Siemens. We had to work there two years, and my parents they had to let us go to Siemens. And then we had to go to they worked as slave workers by Siemens two years. And two years later, they shipped us to Auschwitz. And my parents had, they took them away in 1942 to Poland, near Treblinka, and, and with the children. And my sister and I, we were in Frankfurt already. And we survived Auschwitz two years, and two and a half years of slave camp before. And that's my story. It's very difficult for me to follow our president, Dr. Marty, Mr. Fluke, and the people from the uh, borough president. And most of the things that one, I wanted to uh, touch on, of course, have been said. So I have to change my little speech. I'm not as prepared as you, Dr. Marty. Just a little piece of paper. Hey, uh, firstly, my wife and I are honored to have been invited tonight. And you all know that now is the 70th anniversary of the Crystal Night in Germany. Now, and of course, is the Night of the Broken Glass or the Crystal Nacht. Hey, all this happened on November the 9th and 10th in 1938 in Germany. And I'm sure that uh, many of you have read and studied the subject and uh, why the Nazis uh, uh, ordered the atrocities. And time would have been too short for me tonight to elaborate on everything. And I, I am delighted that Dr. Fluch and has touched on this already. And a lot of you studied this and have seen it uh, by yourselves, because I'm sure there are people here, other people have seen have been there for the Christmas night. Now, uh, 
what you know now really is more of the, what happens to us personally. My wife, of course, has a, a more tragic story than I have. And a, uh, I start with this, as you see, don't get scared. I'm not a rabbi. I'm not giving you a sermon. And I don't sing anything. But this piece of this talus here, I salvaged out of the burning synagogue. And there's still the spots here. And I have it with me throughout the world. When I left Germany in 1940, I was able to relatives to spend the war in Bolivia. And, uh, and from Bolivia, I bought it here, and I wear this talus on every holiday, major holiday, Jewish holiday. And I left it the way it is. Partly the decoration were burned up, of course. And besides this, we saved myself and some of the other younger people. Incidentally, I was a little bit beyond teenage already. I was 18 at the time. And uh, we salvaged a lot of artifacts, what we could, partial parts of the Torah and prayer books, whatever we could. The synagogue in Cologne, Germany, was one of the most magnificent buildings of most of the synagogues in Germany. And it was a large Jewish community. And uh, so that was the beginning. I wasn't aware of it until the midday, what had happened. And as usual, I would uh, take my bike and would go to my place of work, which was, a, as we said in German, Arisiert, that means uh, the Nazis had, been take, had taken over from the Jewish owners, and nobody would think that uh, they still had Jewish employees. I was the only one, and that I would possibly go there. But that was my, my luck, because the, the NOA shielded me, and until this thing was over, they kept me there, so therefore I was not arrested. And so I got away with that one. A, uh, then, of course, I was told to, uh, uh, to help out, not by the Nazis. I got calls from my friends, and the, they had destroyed their, a, uh, their millinery store. And anybody who knows the millinery store knows a lot of glass in the millinery store and windows and uh, mirrors. And it was just about a mess. And the, the charts, the, the glass charts, were all over the place, into the street, and the whole place was demolished. So I helped with some other uh, uh, young people to uh, uh, clean this up because the Nazis ordered us to clean it up. You couldn't leave it the way it is. It had to be secured overnight or whatever, and you, of course, had to pay for that. And to add injury to insult, at the end, the, after everything was done, the uh, insurance, if you had insurance, had to be turned over to the Nazis, so you had to pay it out of your own pocket, and the stores were never reopened. It was the end of the, of the stores. After that, I was called to my, my sister at the time. They had in-laws, of course, and they destroyed their apartment completely. They, I say the old people, they were younger than me, of course, today, but at the time, they were old people, and they didn't have a place to sleep, they didn't have a place to cook, nothing. I had to crawl under the furniture, so they were smashed and everything else, and to try to make a little order in that house and get in a place where they could stay overnight. And that went on in many other places. Uh, to add injury to insult, I have another little document here, and you wouldn't probably believe that it exists. This, this was Christian night in 1938, and the German army, the Wehrmacht, drafted me thereafter. And in early 1939, I have a document here that probably most of you haven't seen, my discharge paper of the German army as a Jew, but permanently discharged from the army. And they have all these, these swastikas and everything here. It's almost ludicrous that things like this could happen, but that's also the Germans for you. Uh, uh, so that's where we're there. Now, President uh, of course, the, the day, it, it finally was called off by... Uh, Goebbels, and they, <coughs> we tried to get back to normal. My job was gone, of course. My parents couldn't make a living anymore, and they were on an age already at the time. And they, uh, now I, I got a new job. My new job was, I had the, I had the choice of uh, becoming a, a construction or a building roads, and I don't think I was strong enough to do those things or go to an agricultural, the Hasharas, or prepare myself for, for Israel, Palestine at the time. 
and ultimately somehow I was able to get a job with the Jewish a community in Cologne. And what was my job? My job was to catalog the returning coffins from the concentration camp that came with little tax on a, who was in there under penalty of, of death. You were not allowed to open it, nor rob by nobody, and then had a little tax there, a heart attack, a, had a uh, uh, pneumonia, or a uh, uh, shot, a uh, fleeing the concentration camp and so on. And for, for some kind of a job I had for weeks and weeks and weeks. A, uh, then, what happened to my family and my, my parents? A, uh, my parents were only uh, deported in 1942, uh, 41, 42, never to be heard from again, including my aunt. My sister made it to America, and uh, I made it to Bolivia, thank God, and uh, came finally in 1947 to America. Uh, I, it's my own comment to this here. In my opinion, for years and years and years, we're discussing the Crystal Night and with my wife and our friends and uh, the few relatives we have. They, in my mind, and I think a lot of your minds, the Crystal Night was the beginning of the show. And, uh, and it was the beginning of the total destruction of German Jewry and all the uniting in the Holocaust as a final solution. And I think a, a Christian night like we do today, 70 years later, we're standing all over in synagogues and places and come around as the, the Christian night. What happened 30 years, 40 years, 20 years ago, all of a sudden it's in vogue. And it has to be, has to be kept under the public. And I hope that some of my Jewish friends, non-Jewish friends are here and listen to this thing and they should even learn more. It's not us who have to learn, we know that. And that note, I... I say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much. I would like to say now we're coming to the high point of our program, but it seems that everybody who's come up here has been so eloquent and high po and reaching a high point. Um, I'm going to call now on can't a muddy fuchs of the Hillcrest Jewish Center to come up here. But before he comes up here, let me tell you something about Mutti and why we asked him to come here today. It's not very difficult to get a cantor in Queens. It's about as difficult as getting a priest in the Vatican. It's very, very easy. Queens has a large Jewish population, and you can count the number of synagogues. Just go down Union Turnpike or Queens Boulevard, and you see that. But Mati is someone special, and I want to take a moment to tell you about him, because Mati is very much involved with the Holocaust Center. Last year, I asked him to come to my survivors group and put on a program. And for those of you who understand Yiddish, Mati is what we call a frailicha mensch. In other words, he's someone outgoing, jovial, and it's very infectious. And he came down uh, with Menasha, who is his accompanist on the, on the accordion. And by the way, Menasha is a former resident of Dachau. Okay. <clears throat> he came down and he put on a program, and the program uh, was one on music, Yiddish music, and music that was part of your heritage before the Holocaust. And people were clapping and swaying and stamping their feet. It was a real happy event. When it was over and everyone is leaving and Menashe is putting away his accordion, one of the women there, name was Esther. Esther is 88 years old a survivor of many camps. She comes up to him, and she's about just under five feet tall, snow white hair, very regal looking. And she said to him, do you know the prayer, Sheila Malot? 
It's one that we've all learned as children. Shir l'malot esai nayim el haharim meayin yavo esri esri mei adonai osesh shemayim vars. I still remember. And it says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains from where comes my help. My help comes from the Lord, the creator of heaven and earth. And Marty says, yeah, I know it. And she said, as a young girl, I was captured in the roundup and sent to my first camp. And I was a graduate of Beis Yaakov. For those of you unfamiliar, Beis Yaakov is a very orthodox yeshiva for girls. And she said, every day, I got up and I sang Shia Lamalas, asking God to help me and save me. And she said, after a year, I stopped because I knew God was not listening and God was not going to save me. And she says, I never sang it again. And Mati says, well, listen. And he hummed it. And he said, come on, sing with me. And she said, come on, sing. And suddenly, Esther stands up very straight and with a fist clenched like this in a very, very loud voice, starts singing Shia Lamalos. And as she sang, everybody listened, and the tears were running down as she realized that for the past 67 years, God had listened to her prayer and had saved her. That's the type of person Mati is. I've asked Mati to take part in our program tonight in presenting to us songs that ought to be remembered, songs that people treasured. Mati. Thank you very much, Arthur. By the way, a couple of years ago, before Pope John, uh, Pope, uh, John Paul passed away, uh, I was uh, among 13 cantors who sang in the Vatican. So at that day, you could find cantors in the Vatican as well. Mantaire Schwester in Brider, my sweet brothers and sisters. The first song uh, we are chosen to sing tonight is totally associated uh, with the Holocaust. It is Mein Städtel brennt, Unser Städtel brennt. And um, As uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hyman spoke, and as Arthur spoke about uh, the Kristallnacht, <clears throat> this song, like, and I sang it before, I sing it every Yom HaShoah and the Holocaust memorials, but tonight it really got a different meaning because it says, can you hear me in the back? Clear? Uh, it says, Brothers, our poor town is burning. Raging winds are fanning the wild flames and furiously tearing, destroying, and scattering everything. Everything is burning. And you stand by and look on with folded arms. You stand and look passively while our town is burning. And then the writer concludes, our town is burning and only you can save it. Extinguish the fire with your very blood if you must. Don't just stand there, brothers with folded arms. Don't stand, put out the fire. Our little town is burning. This was Berlin, it wasn't so little, I believe. And it was burning, and Germany was burning. And this was written by a very famous poet uh, Mordechai Gewirtig. You heard about him? Mordechai Gewirtig wrote the most beautiful songs. He um, wrote this following a program in the Polish town of the Polish town of 
Prastyak in 1938, exactly the same year as Kristallnacht. Mordechai Geberdik wrote the moving song, which was to prove prophetic, unfortunately, prophetic of the Holocaust. Geberdik was a popular Yiddish songwriter before the war. He continued to write and compose songs in the Krakow ghetto. He was murdered, shot by the German Simach on June 4th, 1942. Unser Städtel brennt. And if you're familiar with the refrain, you may join me. Mordechai Geberdik is saying, do not stand with folded arms. Steht nicht Brieder. Steht nicht Brieder mit verlegte Hand. It's interesting, Dr. Flug, where are you? He is talking to his brothers and sisters, to the Jews, because so many of our people, as in Germany, did not believe, like your mom, Mrs. Hyman, it cannot happen. We still don't believe it could happen. <laughs> Brent, Brüder lachs Brent. O unser Orem Städtel nebech Brent. Bis Winden mit ihr Gasen reißen brechen uns blasen. Starker noch die wilde Flammen, als herum schön brennt. Und ihr steht und guckt da so sich mit verlegten Händen. Und ihr steht und guckt da so sich unser Städtel. Spread, spread, breed spread. O unser or im Städtel nebech brennt. So haben schon die Feiere zungen, das ganze Städtel eingeschlungen. Und die Beise winden hodgen, unsere Städtel brennt. Und ihr steht und guckt das so sich mit verelwegten Händ. Und ihr steht und guckt das so sich unsere Städtel Sprint, Bleibe soll wie noch a Schlacht, nur puste schwarze Wind. Und ihr steht und ihr guckt das so sich mit verlegte Und ihr steht Und guckt da so easy, our town 
is burning. Nem die Kehlem lässt du's feier, lässt mit eier eigen Blut, bar weiß, dass ihr das könnt. Steht nie die Brüder, hat das so ist ich, mit verlegte Steht nie die Brüder, lässt das Feier unser Städtel Thank you, my friends. Nobody realized how prophetic the song that was written in 38 will be. Poems, artists often are prophets. They feel they see things that nobody else can feel and see. And Mordechai Gebirtik was one of them. I think to myself, he was murdered in 42. Do you imagine how many poets, artists, singers, musicians, Philosophers, painters, dancers, rabbis, professors, and just good people. How many, how many of the souls, how many? So the next couple songs that Dr. Flug asked me to sing tonight are not directly associated with the Holocaust, but they speak about the world that was and is not anymore. This is given, is given, short manish to. The first song I had chosen is a very famous song, became like an anthem in Jewish songs, amongst Jewish songs, is Oifen Pripichik. And I had chosen it because every town had a Jewish teacher, a Jewish rabbi, who was teaching the little kinderlach, the little children, Aleph base, usually at age three already. And of course goes with not mentioning, you welcome to join. Oifen prepitschik brennt a fire und in Stubes Hays und der Rebbe lern kleine Kinder lach dem alle Bays und der Rebbe lern kleine Kinder lach dem Zog je kinder lach, 
Gedenkse tijere, was hier leren door. Zo zit nog amul, en het ook nog amul, kom het alem oor. Zo zit nog amul, en het ook nog amul, kom het alem. And Dr. Marti, I want to tell you what this song is all about. Oisen Pripitschik at the fireplace. Brenta Feil, there's a fire. Outside is very cold. Typical European town, Stettel. And the rabbi usually, sometimes at his home, had one room about 10, 20 young kids sitting like a table like this. Some of you might have learned there. How many of you learned in a cheder? Yes. So they were sitting around, and the rabbi, the method was to repeat. And he said, comets, aleph, and aleph, the first letter, with the comets, which makes it aw or a, ah, in that case, all, oh, he says, repeat after me, Kinderlach, repeat after me, Kometz Aleph O. Great method for educators. Do you know that there was almost no Jew in Europe who did not know to read at least basic Hebrew? At least basic Hebrew. One of the few places that I saw are using the same method was in Jerusalem. I pass near the very religious quarter and I hear the rabbi says, Chazelt noch nie, repeat after me, Kometz Aleph, oh. And they say with their little voices, Kometz Aleph, oh. And I say there's still some places but a lot of places don't do this anymore. It was gone. And then the rabbi says to his students, Hased ver kinder, elter ven, vet ir alein fasten. We flin di oises, Liegen Tränen, ohne wie viel Gewinn. Wie fliehen die Äußes, liegen Tränen, ohne wie viel Gewinn. Dr. Marti, the Rabbi says, when you little kinder last will all become, you will understand how much love is in those letters, how much care, but also how much pain, how much Love in those letters, how much care, and we feel cry, giving. And then the rabbi says, As irvet kinder, when you kiss, the goal is schlepp. Can't translate that. <laughs> Sometimes it's difficult to live when you are discriminated. This is what it means. When you are beaten because your color of the skin, because of your beliefs, because you are called, in this case, Jew. Because you come from Judea. 
and you are. So you will understand how difficult it is. Zolt yirifun di oises koyech shepen kuktin ezei arai Zolt yirifun di oises koyech shepen When you look into them, when you will say those words, those letters, they will strengthen you. Koyach shepen, kuktinezei Look at them, read them, pray them. Zog je kinder la, gideng she tayere, vos Repeat those beautiful letters. Comet Aleph. Comet Aleph. Oh. Thank you. I remember you, we studied together Torah. And the Rabbi, some of them, had the method they had a little stick. And if you did not behave, a little bit on the fingers. And I'm told that sometimes it was a little bit more than that and was painful. Usually they were very merciful. It was just to, they had to wave it. Somehow it worked. I don't know how, but it worked. He says, even that, I'm missing. I'm missing. I wish I could see that Rebbe again with the stick. <laughs> How is Avreimale? How is Zalmele and Yosele? I dream about you so often. We play in the garden. We study Torah. And I know this is given, is given, shoin mernish do. I'm an old man now. Life flew too fast. What I have are the memories and the dream. Der kind dich noch ohne Bli. Du bist gewei mein Chaver um ihr die Ohre bald zu rief. Und euch in Geider hob mir gelernt lang banant. Und steht vor mir der Rebbe noch der Kanschik in sein Hand zieht. Oi, ohne Mann zurück die Jorn, jene schöne Zeit. Oi, du jung geschöne Leben, ist von uns schon erweit. Mein Freund, hoi noch jenem Besen reben, wenn das Herz noch heim. Wie geht es, Epis? Berlin, aus Berlin, auf Reimale, wo es macht, und Salmale und Josale, so ihr Ich hole mit Funach Kinderlach, 
Je zijn ze kinderen niet. Je worden altijd jidalaar. Wie snel dat leven vliegt. Oei, oremer, zurig die jorn, mooi zal hij mijn vriend. Oei, nog hier in mijn jonge lijn, Bang das Herz noch heilt. Last song of this group, very, very famous song, talks about, you'll forgive me, change of weather, little cold, but in heart is warm. Mein Städtele Bills, one Städtele of many, was Torah, was learning, was laughter, was singing. My town bells in Poland. And the writer says, I remember the house, but now the house is, look like a, house that was left for a long time and the windows the glass the glass broken shattered der erzähl mir alte der erzähl mir weil ich will wissen, alles hat Sinn. Wie seht ihr das Stiebele, wo es hat am Müll geglanzt? Sie blüht noch das Beimale, was ich hab verpflanzt. Du Stiebel ist alt, verwachst mit Mochen groß. Der Alter hat acht zerfällt, der Fenster ohne Glus. Der Garnik ist krim, Sie beugen die Wand, die wollst du schön mehr, gar nicht der Kern. Der Garnik ist krim, der Ruf ist, sie beugen die Wand, die Walls are, die wollst du schön mehr, you will never recognize your home. Again, sing with me, Kinderlach. Oi, 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 bells. Meine Städte, alle bells. Meine Heim, alle Wichob. Meine Kinder, sie jüren verbrannt. Besti amul gewein in Bels, in meine Städte alle Bels, in Ormen Stiebale mit alle Kinder lach dort gelacht. Jeden Schabes pfleg ich läufen dort mit dem chemischen Gleis. Zu sitzen unter dem grünen Baum, alle lehnen bei dem Teich. Oi, 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 Bells, meine Städte. 
Italy bills. Money, Male, Dore, Viechom, Mine, Shane, Haloine. Mein Städtele Bells. Thank you. I am not going to sing. <clears throat> However, <laughs> However, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce and call up several of the people who are here who've really made our Holocaust Center a most effective one. And I'd like to start off with Assemblyman Mark Weprin. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Arthur. Just a technical question on that. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, terrific to be here. Dr. Marti, Cantor Fuchs, uh, members of the board, and so many friends who I see here um, and uh, are here to uh, commemorate this uh, occasion of Kristallnacht, uh, such a horror in, in the history of the world. And um, Cantor Fuchs mentioned how um, so many people at the time and Heyman's as well, uh, refused to uh, believe it could happen. And unfortunately, today, there are those who don't believe it happened. And uh, one of the purposes of this Holocaust Center that is being built outside, uh, and the work that Dr. Marti and Arthur Flug and, and so many of you are, are behind, is to tell people not only did it happen, and not only was it as horrible as all this, but it should never happen again. And that is the real point behind it. And uh, I won't go on very long. I'm joined here today uh, by my colleague in the assembly, Rory Landsman. If he could come up, too, I'll have him say a few words. He and I have to run somewhere from here, so I apologize. But I know he and I are very heartened by what's going on in Washington, our new leader um, in Washington. And, a, and I think it's just important to note in this, in this group, a chief of staff to that president, who's the son of Israeli an Israeli immigrant, uh, who has always had a very strong voting record on U.S.-Israel relations, and I think is a very good symbol for us as Jews and, and as supporters of Israel for the future of this administration. Without further ado, Rory, and then we have a little presentation to make. Rory Lansman, ladies and gentlemen. Thank, thank you, Mark. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's, uh, ordinarily, when you start remarks, you might say, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. But given the circumstances and, and the seriousness of this even, evening, I'll say in, instead, Arthur, it's, it's meaningful to be here, as it always is uh, at an events that are run by the Holocaust Resource Center, uh, Dr. Marti, and all the distinguished guests, Cantor Fuchs. Uh, tonight is a very moving experience. Whenever you hear uh, Holocaust survivors uh, tell of the experiences that they had, uh, you can't help but, but be moved. Although the, the thing that, that made me think most uh, tonight was when uh, I think it was Arthur who mentioned uh, the growing Jewish community. If you go down Union Turnpike or Queens Boulevard or, or, or Main Street, uh, you see signs of Jewish life, the Jewish stores, the supermarkets, the, the restaurants, the, the synagogues. And usually we just drive uh, past those. Occasionally we'll, we'll go in. Some of us might go in on a regular basis. But this evening as I was coming here tonight I, I, and listening to Arthur, I thought that how uh, behind each store and inside each of those stores and restaurants uh, is a family, a Jewish family, that runs it and, and owns it, and it's their, their living and their livelihood. And so many of us go into those stores, and, and when we do, uh, we're not just shopping, we're actually being part of the, the Jewish fabric of the Jewish community here in Queens. And what Kristallnacht uh, meant uh, the, those decades ago and what we remember is the possible, is the destruction of stores like those and the murder of, of families like uh, the people who we see in those stores and, and people like ourselves who, who shop there. The, the most important thing that we can do 
There's lots of things that we can do for survivors and, and for the memory of the, the people who uh, did not survive the Holocaust, but perhaps the most important thing that we can do is to remember events like Kristallnacht so that we can uh, know how to prevent future Kristallnachts, how to realize the saying, uh, never again, so that it really is true. And that's uh, why we come here, and that's why we remember Kristallnacht, that's why we participate in the activities of the Holocaust Resource Center, uh, and that's why we're uh, honoring the two guests uh, this evening who have the, pr uh, the privilege of, of knowing uh, personally. Uh, Linda Spiegel is uh, from the Margaret Teeth Center in my district. If anyone, uh, if anyone has a family member there or, or has ever had the occasion to, to visit there, they know that it's not just a special place, but it's a special place for the Jewish community and, of course, uh, Vicki Schnepps and the contributions that she makes to all of Queens and to the Jewish community in, in particular uh, in many ways, but, also, but primarily through the publication of the Courier newspapers. Uh, Arthur, you could not have, uh, could not have thought of uh, two, two uh, greater people to honor. And Mark, Mark tells me to, I should invite you to come up. And Mark is senior to me in the assembly, so I do what he tells me. So Linda and, and Vicki, why don't you come on up? Okay, well, why don't you stay here, Ari? And why don't we make the, we're making uh, our own little presentation, Arthur. Is that okay if you'll, you'll, you'll join us? We, uh, well, we, well, we'll present these. I'm not going to read them right now, but, um, but Linda and Vicky and I join in Rory in saying how special these two people are to, to our community here in Queens, uh, to so many of the people that they help, and how they go f w above and beyond where they need to go in what they do. And uh, it's not just jobs for them. It is a, a, a true uh, a cause for each of them. And Vicky is born on causes and became a, a hero here on causes, and she continues today. Dr. Marti, you want to join us as well? Author? Yes. Come on. Move back. Move back. Move back. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, you will. I'm not going to. I'm going to let you wait a minute. Okay. If I, ladies, come back. Come back. Don't go away. Don't go away. Come back, please. Uh, in another life, when I was present in my synagogue, I was told that if you want to honor someone, honor the richest man or woman in the congregation, because you'll definitely get a bonus on it. Uh, uh, these people are rich beyond what we normally have, and they were picked for a certain reason, a very, very certain reason, not simply because uh, they're well known but by what they do. Um, Linda Spiegel is the uh, community relations director of the Margaret Teets Home, which in itself is an enormous job. But the Margaret Teets Center, from what I've learned, was founded years ago to service Holocaust survivors. Uh, I first came across the uh, Margaret Teets Center uh, through some family members that were there um, as residents, but I also came across Linda Spiegel in recognizing the fact that here's a woman who uh, almost sought me out to say, we have Holocaust survivors here, and would you like to do something with them? And we first started off by having some of our student interns come in and um, work and interview some of the Holocaust survivors. We also have students who are in our nursing program uh, working at the Margaret Teets Holocaust Center. But we've gone beyond that because Linda tends to think in the very broad range of community. And as a result, one of the things she did, one of the things that Linda did was to work in setting up an annual Holocaust concert. We do this every year at the Margaret Teets Center. We open it up for the entire community. We do it at no cost. They assume the entire cost of the program. And we bring several hundred people 
out of the community. Many of them come because they, some are shut-ins, some feel that, you know, I could make it to the Margaret Teeth Center. And we have a wonderful program because of that. And because of that, I'd like to introduce Linda Spiegel. Obviously, anybody that knows me knows I don't have trouble speaking. I um, do a lot of that, but today is a very special day, and it's um, really thanks to Arthur that I'm here. He can say all the wonderful things about me that he likes, but I can say many more wonderful things about Arthur Fluke. He is an incredible man and really with a mission, a mission to help this community. And. Uh, I don't usually write speeches because I really feel that if you speak from your heart, that's the most important thing. But there were really some special things that I wanted to say here tonight. So I did prepare a speech, and I promise that it won't be very long. Uh, but there were things that I felt that were important to say. Uh, and I'll start with saying that um, there are many thoughts that crossed my mind this evening, uh, especially the exceptional place that I've worked for all the years that I've worked at Margaret Teets, 27 years. It's a long time, it's a lifetime. <laughs> I was fortunate in growing up in Bayside in a two-family house with my grandparents. Uh, not having family who were broken apart by the Holocaust, my family was just like everybody else's family here in Bayside until I got older and then started meeting my friends, who many of them were survivors. I really suppose as a child, my parents really tried to protect me from that. They didn't want me to know what had happened in Germany. They felt that, how can you handle that as a child? So for me, learning about the Holocaust was really being part of Margaret Teeth Center. That's where I got my education. That's where I met these incredible people. At the time, back in the 70s, when I started working at Margaret Teeth's, which seems impossible, but it's true, there were approximately 85% of our patient population were survivors. The board of directors, the founders, were made up of dedicated, compassionate Holocaust survivors and those whose lives were dramatically impacted because of the Holocaust. It was their primary mission to provide exceptional care and a safe haven for those who had lived through these atrocities, a place where dignity and compassion was of the utmost concern. These individuals could have come to this country and tried to forget how the world went mad, but instead they made it their life's work to volunteer their time and efforts to ensure that by this unique mission alone, the now renamed Margaret Teets Nursing and Rehabilitation Center would ensure that no one would ever forget those who had lost so much. I was at Margaret Teets when it was called the Kew Gardens Nursing Home many years ago. And because of the work of Margaret Teets and the founders, our facility was renamed. I've had the privilege of meeting hundreds of survivors over the course of my career. Some are able to speak about these horrific experiences, some not. We have cared for the famous and not so famous, but each had a heroic story of survival. I think of Annie Altman, Carola Ney, Nachum Lieberman, Flora Block, each proud and fine people with an inner strength and optimism making the best of life. They each became a part of our family at Margaret Teets Center. I think of Margaret Teets, a social worker from Cologne, Germany, whose mission it was, along with other founders, to establish this remarkable residence. I think of Hildegard and Frederick Tuchman, Rudolf and Hedwig Stahl, the Roskams, Leo Bendit, and of course, Mr. Albert U. Tietz, son of Margaret Tietz, who devoted countless years to our success and growth. They were individuals who held steadfast to their ideals and vision. There are board members and volunteers here this evening who have given so much of themselves to make the Tietz Center what it is today. Eva Maria Tausig, Trudy Schwarz, Peter Mayer, Ann Moss, Harry Plout, Irene Borovoy. The question is, what can we do? What have I done? 
give of yourself. Give of yourself like it really matters. Change perceptions. Many years ago when my daughter Sarah was in elementary school, at the suggestion of my dear husband Ted, I started an Adopt-A-Grandparent program. My daughter Sarah and many of her friends were part of that first year. This program was duplicated in many facilities with the Teat Center setting the standard. Bringing the generations together, learning the stories, ending the fear, opening new doors. We were part of the Shoah Foundation's efforts and countless other efforts to remember and document the histories and stories of our residents. Sitting on committees like the Hate Crimes Committee here at the Holocaust Center and being a part of the intolerance. Bringing up Rabbi Yossi Blasovsky to assist with our annual Yom HaShoah service, our Chabad rabbi right here in Bay Terrace. Partnering with Dr. Flug on the annual Holocaust Remembrance Concert, which is open to the public to ensure that we never forget. Open your hearts to volunteering. We all make the difference in our borough, city, state, and country. Our positive attitude, our spirit of compassion for each other is what sets the tone for the world in which we live. Remember the past and give to the future. In the last two years, the Teat Center joined with the Beth Abraham Family of Health Services to enable the Teat Center to flourish. New outreach efforts have taken place in the community with the installation of a glot kosher kitchen, a Shabbos apartment, a Shabbos elevator, and Shabbos entryway. The support of Beth Abraham under the leadership of Michael Fassler, President and CEO, and the Foundation for Elder Care in memory of Mark Kretitz, Chairman Zev Zemir, made possible the revitalization of our mission with a gift, a gift of our history with an original artwork in bas-relief by well, world-renowned artist Mikhail Muchnik, entitled From Darkness to Light, displayed prominently in our lobby. The work represents the darkness of the Holocaust and the hope and light of Jerusalem. A sacred Holocaust Torah rescued from Votis, Czechoslovakia, during Kristallnacht came to the Teat Center by way of England in 1986. This sacred Torah is incorporated into the magnificent artwork to remember those lost, those cared for, and the hope for future generations. I invite each of you down to see this beautiful and inspiring work. I remember my daughter's days in Hebrew school at the Bay Terrace Jewish Center and the teachings of the Holocaust and my fear that it was too soon. I know now that it is never too soon. It is each of our responsibility to ensure that future generations are aware of what we can, what can and did happen to six million of our brethren. In closing, I would just like to say, remember the past. That's what shapes you as a person. Remember the inhumanity which we remember this day. But think of the future we have as a community to make the world a better place by opening our hearts and minds, being a proponent for the growth and acceptance of people from diverse backgrounds, cultures, ethnicities, religions, and disabilities. We are the change we seek. I thank everyone involved for this great honor. I just want to say that I accept this award on behalf of my family, but I also accept this award on behalf of all the survivors that I've been privileged to know, privileged to serve, and privileged to know at this time that work at Margaret Teets. I can say that Claire has been an incredible supporter of Margaret Teets. She has been there. I see Anita Worsbrod in the audience here. She's been a volunteer at Margaret Teets. Very special people have been part of our organization, and I thank all of you for being here tonight. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Uh, the next person is somewhat of a superwoman. We, we always struggle with the problem of how are we going to increase Holocaust education? How are we going to make people more aware of what we do? How are we going to get the message out? The answer is own a newspaper. And uh, Vicki Schnepps-Yunis one day calls me and says, 
um, we're going to do a series on the Holocaust. It's going to be five separate editions with inserts having to do with the story of the Holocaust. I'm sending over two reporters. I want them to talk to you and do it. And simply by calling up, as a matter of fact, this is the way I go about business, this is what we're doing, hundreds, hundreds, and thousands of people in Queens County got to learn in detail about their neighbors, many of whom are survivors, and many of whom are explicitly knowledgeable about the Holocaust. And Vicki, we thank you, and we'd like you to come up. He doesn't have to thank me. I've got to thank you, Dr. Marty and Dr. Flug, because you have created something for us in Queens that is extraordinary. And without you, we wouldn't all be here remembering. And I think that's what today is all about, remembering. I want to point to my Noah Rosenberg and Jessica Lyons. Would you please stand up? Let everybody see who did the writing of this magnificent piece of work. Crystal Knott. They spent months interviewing people who survived. They spent months working on a video, which you can see on our website. They spent months tearing at their hearts the messages that we must continue to spread. I got into the news business through an abomination. How many of you remember a place called Willowbrook that Geraldo Rivera exposed? Well, my daughter Lara was at Willowbrook because in the early 1970s, nobody knew about a place called Willowbrook. And in the early 1970s, there were no group homes. There were no day programs for children with disabilities. There were none of the services in the community that exist today. And with a heavy harp and great trepidation, we brought my daughter Lara to Willowbrook with hope. Well, within a short time, the budgets were slashed within one year for the Department of Mental Hygiene that funded Willowbrook. And abominations were existing again. In this room today, there are young people amongst the survivors and the people who care. But if you know that there are abominations in your community, it is never too late. And we must never stop keeping our eyes open and our hearts open to abominations. And so I created an organization for retarded children, WRC, and I see um, a board member of ours is here tonight. Thank you for coming. And WRC was a women's organization for retarded children, helping to make a difference in the lives of the children at Willowbrook. And we began fundraising and doing volunteering and bringing busloads of people. But we realized one day that that was not enough. And we were knocking on air. No one was listening to us until a cub reporter by the name of Geraldo Rivera came to Willowbrook, interviewed me, talked to me about my problems, and I became the symbol of a mother in need, a mother who's looking for hope, for help. And it was Geraldo's using the power of the press that helped tell our story. And to this day, I think what got me into the news business, because I started my newspapers in my living room with four children on a hope and a prayer to make a difference. And I saw through Geraldo's eyes and through Geraldo's coverage that you can make a difference. You can raise your voice. You can be heard. And it is my privilege to have started the Queen's Couriers in my living room 24 years ago and to see it grow and flourish to what it is today, serving the entire borough of Queens. But I thank you, Dr. Marty, for creating this opportunity for us as a Queens Courier community newspapers to make a difference and to help people remember we must never forget. I thank you so much for this wonderful recognition. I'd like to call up two people who uh, come along with Vicki, uh, Noah Rosenberg and Jessica Lyons. Can you come up here? Uh, 
These are the two reporters I told you about. Usually they're sitting there taking pictures and writing about what's happening here. But I wanted to come up with something special. Uh, uh, these two people, uh, Jessica and Lyons, knows, used to show up every Friday morning at our Holocaust uh, uh, Survivors Program, uh, speaking with the Holocaust survivors, uh, getting parts of their stories, going out into the homes, going to meet them. And the survivors sort of took them under their wing and adopted them. And uh, they came up. Uh, one of the women there who tends to be the self-appointed spokesman for the survivors, uh, one day stopped me and says, Arthur, uh, this, uh, the Noah and Jessica, uh, are they seeing anyone? And, 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 and I, you know, having been in that situation, I said, leave them alone. Leave them alone. It's OK. But uh, these two people really came and put together an amazing story. Uh, we put part of it into this uh, publication that you received when you came in. If you didn't get it, please take one on the outside. But they did uh, an enormous amount of writing and, and interviewing and research. And we put it together. It really came into being an outstanding document. And we want to thank you. You see, we always worry that. What about the younger generation? And there's the answer. We don't have to worry. They're there. We thank you. I just want to make my little pitch that what we're trying to do, this is only two parts of, th of a five-part series. And we're trying to create it into a booklet that then can be distributed both throughout the county and through the country as something to never forget and to forever remember. So we're working on raising the funds. I'm sorry, Mark left and uh, you know Rory left. But uh, we have Diane Dosh, Roseanne Dosh here from the Borough <laughs> President's Office. We can get a million twenty thousand. We can get this done. So we hope you will all please pick it up and make sure that you do keep it. And we have cherished being able to do it. Do you want to say something, Alan? Yes. yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to thank Dr. Flug for this great honor of being here today. Um, but I think I speak for Jessica when I say the true honorees tonight are the people out in the crowd, uh, the survivors of Kristallnacht and of the Holocaust, who 70 years later still carry the memory of the people who didn't survive. Um, you know, they had the courage, they had the strength to invite us into their homes to summon up their painful memories and share their stories with us so that the world will never forget. Uh, I think you know, Jessica and I are both forever humbled by the courage, by the bravery, by the perseverance, and by the friendship that uh, these people have shared with us. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I'd like to call uh, representing uh, New York City Controller William Thompson, Martha Taylor. Dr. Flug, Dr. Marti, honorees. The Comptroller wanted me to come here and just let you know how important he thinks it is to keep having this commemoration every year. And of course, the 70th anniversary is a very big year. And more important, he wants me to tell you how proud and pleased he is of all the work you do, educating in the classroom and in the community uh, and, and constantly letting people never forget about the Holocaust. Something that Cantor said before about repetition, and I'm just probably repeating everything that's been said here earlier this evening, but that repetition, Cantor, you're right, is very important in learning and in keeping on remembering what happened. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, representing uh, Congressman Anthony Weiner. Would you like to come up, please? Hi, thank you, uh, Dr. Flug, for letting me speak. I'll be brief in, uh, in the style of my boss. I'm hit and run. Uh, we're here commemorating uh, an event that marks the beginning and in many ways has come to define uh, a very dark period for the Jewish people, Jewish community, I dare say for the, for the world as well. Um, the idea that we're citizens of a place, of a universe where something like that could have happened still should shock me. It should shock everyone. I haven't really come to grips with it, and I would be distrustful of anybody who, who felt that they did. 
Uh, we, live in a, we live in a great country now. It has been good to us, and we should be thankful for that. But tonight should stand, should work as a remembrance. We should be heedful. We should be watchful. And uh, we should remember what can happen. We, could, we should remember what happens when darkness that lies in the hearts of men is let to grow and manifest itself in, a, in an incredible way. So again, I'm here representing Congressman Wiener. I'm glad to say that he is and always has been the staunchest of allies of the Jewish community in Queens and Brooklyn and the entire country. Thank you. Hashem Yenakim Kim Damam. Thank you. Just some people I'd like to point out who are here. Uh, Mark Haken, a member of our educational task force community. Uh, Joe Shiami, the uh, chairman of the Holocaust Resource Center Advisory Board. Janet Cohn, secretary of our advisory board. Ellen Zinn, a member of our advisory board. I don't know if I left out anybody else. Uh, I want to, before we come to the close, um, I have a part that I find very difficult. Uh, <clears throat> as you probably know, uh, I don't have a problem getting up and speaking in front of people, but uh, <clears throat> uh, two years ago, I, got, I received a call from a friend of mine uh, who's in the public relations business, and he says, Arthur, you have to do me a favor. And I said, well, what's the favor? And he says, I represent an international organization of hairdressers. And I'm saying, well, I can hardly wait till what comes next. And, you know, and I said, I have a barber, you know, I don't need anybody. And he said, one of these people who is on the governing board is 92 years old. He's a Holocaust survivor. <clears throat> They're having a, uh, their annual conference. And will you go down and say a few words? And, give him a citation, and you can't say no to something like that. Then I went down, it was at the Waldorf. <clears throat> I was surprised 1,500 people showed up, and I'm standing on the stage uh, with dozens of, of hairdressers. <clears throat> <laughs> and uh, they called up this gentleman, a young, uh, he's sort of like a young 92. He was spry, he was dynamic. His name was Charles Analick, and I said a few words on his behalf, and we gave him a citation. And after the uh, ceremony was over, we went backstage, and I was talking to him, and he was crying. He was very moved that anybody would think of awarding him a citation simply because of being a Holocaust survivor and his service to the community. And when I got back to my office the following day, I just sent him a note saying, Dear Charles, it was pleasure meeting with you, and um, you know, I wish you luck. And um, about three weeks later, I got an answer from him, telling him that he currently lives in Des Moines, Iowa. He's active in the Jewish community there, in the Iowa State Holocaust Commission. And over about a year and a half, we became pen pals. And I would send him copies of our new exhibit. He would send me newspaper clippings. And sometimes in the end of July, he called up and he was crying. <clears throat> I said, Charles, what's wrong? And he said, uh, my wife's gone. Um, she w didn't pass away. She just developed severe Alzheimer's. And she went into a home. And we talked a little more. And on and on, we, we would call each other maybe every other week just to talk. On September 15th of this year, I received this envelope. And if you look at the envelope, it's addressed to me. It's addressed to the wrong address. It's addressed to 53rd Avenue when we're at 56th Avenue. But scrawled on here is a message that says, Postman, please make it right. This is very important. And it says, Charles Analick, the hospice, Des Moines, Iowa. So you knew there was a problem. And this letter had been floating around for a month before the post office figured out that Queensborough College is located on 56th Avenue, not 53rd Avenue. And when I opened it up, uh, it was a very difficult letter. Uh, to show you that he was a hairdresser, it was, it was written on L'Oreal stationery. <laughs> And he said, dear Arthur, I am in a hospice now, and I'm dying. I have cancer in my bones. And if you looked at the 
handwriting, you can see the pain. He said, there is nothing that the medicine can do for me anymore. I'm going to die, but I want you to do me a favor. Says, I want you to be sure that my children and grandchildren and friends don't forget me. Um, that's quite an order, since he lives in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, I immediately called him, and I was told that uh, we can put the call through, and having had friends and relatives were in the hospice, I understood, so I wrote him a letter, and the letter came back a week later, unopened. Uh, uh, one of the great things about having Google, when you go on Google, you can find all sorts of things, and I began looking it up, and I found his daughter, also by the same name, Charles Analick, living in Des Moines, Iowa also, and I called her, and we spoke at great length, and I said, you know, your dad uh, sent me this letter, and um, <coughs> I liked... <coughs> I would like to know more about him. And so what I did was I listened to her, I did some research, and when we put our exhibit out tonight, you can see over on uh, my right-hand side, there are three easels, each with pictures showing different scenes of the Holocaust. But you see one standing in the corner, it's a white <coughs> poster. On that poster is a picture of a very young, very handsome, young man, Charles Analick, was born in Lithuania. When the Germans came in, um, his brother was killed in the first pogrom that took place that night, as was his girlfriend. Uh, Charles was a very, very dynamic man, and he was on the Lithuanian soccer team, which after about two weeks was challenged by the soccer team of the invading German army and they were challenged to a match, a match they couldn't say no to. And so they went ahead, they played against the German team, and they lost. And as a way of celebrating the commandant of the German army that invaded Lithuania, allowed each of the winning players on the German team to select 10 Jews and execute them. That was a way of doing it. Charles and his family were sent to a ghetto. After the ghetto, uh, they were forced, his mother and father were lost in the ghetto. He and his brother were forced on a death march back towards Berlin as the war ended. Uh, they were captured by American soldiers. He went to the university uh, after the war, and in 1950, he came to the United States, and in New York City, he was looking for a job, and he was walking, and as he told me, I was walking down Fifth Avenue, and there was a hairdresser shop there, and it said, hairdresser wanted. He said, well, you know, I used to give my brother haircuts. What's so hard about that? And he went in, and he was hired, and he became a well-known hairdresser along Fifth Avenue in the various salons until 1955 when he went to visit a cousin in Des Moines, Iowa, and there met his wife. And he relocated his business from Fifth Avenue to Des Moines, Iowa. And over the, the several months that I knew him, he uh, went ahead and would send me clippings of how he received this award and how I received that award. And um, we sort of became friends. And uh, I just felt, um, you know, I really couldn't say no to that request. Uh, I usually don't take time out to give individuals the stories of people unless to prove a point. But, you know, he asked that he at least make it known so he wouldn't be forgotten. I'm going to send the poster that we put uh, together uh, to his daughter and some comments about it. Hopefully, that will have met what he requested. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, I had asked Roseanne Darsh, uh, the borough president's office, uh, to put together some type of citation of commemoration. 
and recognition for Charles Analick, and this is what put together, I don't have to read it because it would be repeating a story, but it's a way of saying that we got your letter, we did what you said. Thank you for that. <clears throat> and finally, coming to the end of our program, as we end every program with the memorial prayer, Kael Malay Rachamim, Cantor, could I ask you to come up? I have a little unusual uh, favor to ask. Uh, usually, can you hear me? Yeah. You know, usually in a public uh, memorial service, we don't wear a talus. But tonight is different, and following Mr. Hyman's uh, introducing the talus, the surviving talus, would you allow me to wear it while we recite the prayer? And I would ask Mr. and Mrs. Hyman to please come stand near me. Is there anybody else here who is a who lived through the Kristallnacht. If you are, please come stand near me. I would uh, appreciate that very much. If you were through the Kristallnacht at, uh, in Germany. May I wear it? Thank you, my brother. O oh God, full of compassion, who dwells on high, find perfect peace and accept the souls of all those, the six million, our brothers, our sisters, men, women, children, babies, were murdered, burned, buried alive, in all the ghettos and concentration camps, and that awful night in Germany, the crystal night, the night of the shattered glasses. Our life was shattered forever. We pray that all the souls are high in Gan Eden in the Garden of Eden, close to you, God Almighty, the creator of all. Accept and bring peace to their souls. And let us say, Amen.
ששתה מיליונים, אחינו ואחיותינו, אנשים, נשים וטף, שנהרגו ושנרצחו ושנשרפו ונגברו בעודם בחיים על קידוש השם באושוויץ בוכנוולד דכאו בכל רחבי גרמניה, ברגן בלסון, טרבלינקה, מיידנק, סביבור, גטו ורשה, ובשאר מחנות השמדה באירופה, בידי המרצחים הנאצים ועוזריהם משאר העמים, יימח שמם! יימח שמם! בעבור שאנו מתפללים ללא ובוי נשמותיהם בגן צרור החיים
Can I ask Vicki and Linda to please come back up here for a moment? Roseanne, could I ask you to come on? Gotta come on. Karen Koslowitz, who left early, was unable to present these at the time. So on half of the borough president, we'd like to present these. Okay? Smile for the picture. Smile for the picture. Where's that market? Please. Please. You've got to get a new camera. <laughs> Okay, that's it. And finally, as we close this service, I, I would like to bring to your attention that this Sunday at 2 o'clock at Queens College, there will be a borough-wide rally against anti-Semitism to which you're all invited. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. <laughs>